All right, so I would like to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me here in person. Really appreciate that to be back in person at a conference, it's wonderful. And also for the programming, I think my uh, talk, as you will see, goes extraordinarily well with what we uh, just heard, heard. So academic publishing has, as a marketplace, uh, academic publishing, as many of us know, has become one of the most profitable businesses in the global digital knowledge economies. Consolidating the production and distribution of humanities scholarship in the hands of an oligopoly of for profit publishers. Control of access to publishing expertise and professional tools, as well as paywalled websites and databases as distribution channels, have limited access to humanities scholarship to geographically, economically, socially, and linguistically privileged users for the most part, uh, for, uh, mostly in the global north. Benefiting from the move to digital distribution, the specific uh, business models of the big five in social sciences, humanities publishing, coupled with tight integration into quality assurance and research assessment regimes, uh, for example, Scopus, Web of Science, well known, uh, in global academia and the global outsourcing of editorial work, such as translation, copy editing, and typesetting, too often accompanied by exploitative labor practices, have garnered huge profit margins for the academic publishing industry, uh, reaching uh, beyond 40% in some cases. As a CBC News feature, uh, Canadian Public Broadcasting, uh, on academic publishing for profit states blithely. The quality control is free, the raw material is free, and then you charge very, very high amounts. Of course, you come up with very high profit margins. While publishing in the humanities has remained relatively dispersed compared to the social sciences, uh, the perceived importance of access to centralized digital publishing infrastructure controlled by the big commercial publishers, which has increasingly moved beyond the financial reach of even relatively big universities, seems to exert similarly centralizing pressures. The shift in academic publishing from being based in scholarly associations and going through university presses to a highly concentrated global market in English has had discernible consequences for not only the working conditions of academics, but also for the potentialities of circulating diverse forms of knowledge creation and curation across languages and cultures. And we call it now often knowledge production, which I think is also very indicative of uh, the capitalized processes here. Metrics regimes of quality assurance provided by the same players that dominate the publication system, else we are moving into quality assurance uh, technology big time, uh, provided um, normalize what are now commonly referred to as deliverables in a system in which market indicators serve as the ultimate arbiter and jeopardize plurality and diversity. What I would like to present today is a case study of an attempt to find a sustainable way for scholar-led academic publishing that draws on existing digital tools and their affordances for workflows uh, that minimize both labor and technological expertise requirements, two factors that are often cited by the commercial publishing market to justify its market oligopoly, while at the same time avoiding the outsourcing of what are already existing forms of expertise within the humanities, copy editing, design, and translation, understood here as a form of engagement with multilinguality as well as multimodality. Not everything needs to or should be translatable and or translated. Let me be clear, the attempts I'm about to outline to engage and resist global academic publishing as a commercial enterprise are not predominantly born out of, an, out, out of ethical concerns about oligopoly capitalism per se, although most of us have those, obviously. Nor do they try to harken back to a previous period of publishing through small elitist networks in the humanities, riddled, as we all know, by male cronyism, structural racism, and Eurocentric language elitism. Rather, we are trying here to probe in what way digital tools can be mobilized for production workflows and labor practices that reclaim humanities publishing for a responsible and reparative stewardship of a multiplicity of knowledges in plural languages under the auspices of fair labor practices that balance mentoring, care, expertise, cooperation, 
fair wages and diversity. So let me uh, turn to my practical example, uh, the peer-reviewed journal Imaginations, Journal of Cross-Cultural uh, Image Studies. It's a multilingual open access journal that is free to submit to and free to read and generally attempts to rethink practices of academic publishing in a humanities context. Founded at the University of Alberta in 2010 by a grassroots initiative of colleagues in the humanities disciplines, a round of funding through, the Canada, through Canada's Social Science and Humanities Research Council sustained a labor and intensive production process that involved publication on a WordPress site and archiving in the University of Libraries open journal system. The WordPress site featured both HTML and PDF versions. Uh, the latter were produced through outsourcing to a graphic design, designer who used Adobe InDesign for PDF production. Despite growing readership and interest, production practices provide, proved unsustainable, even while the journal received fairly substantial funding, simply because of the labor involved. By 2018, PDF production lagged almost three years behind the publication of articles simply on account of the work schedule of the designer, and proofreading across multiple formats proved error prone. Then the funding ran out, and the editorship was advertised. Admiring the journal's open access vision for cultural visual studies, I applied, and so the journal moved to York University with a reconstituted editorial team and no funding. Invested in the idea of scholar-led open access publishing, we did not want to seek out a commercial publisher. And as an online publication, we were not really attractive for the few Canadian academic associations that still publish print journals, especially as imaginations had been established as an alternative to those. We began by rejigging our workflow, keeping in mind the kinds of constraints Rupika Risam and Alex Jill describe as minimal computing in their introduction to the special issue of Digital Humanities Quarterly on Minimal Computing, which they understand as a, pra quote, praxis that resists the idea that innovation is defined by newness, scale, and scope, end quote. We set out to use, adapt, tweak, or hack existing open and free tools, as well as existing infrastructure, and to focus on interfaces to those to minimize and automate the labor on production technologies. In what follows, let me briefly elaborate on how we responded to challenges in workflow and resources, especially in regard to the labor. Inspired by the, this, yeah, okay. Inspired by the sustainable publishing method described by Tenen and Witthoff in The Programming Historian, we aimed for a modular system underpinned by open tools, human readable and formats, sustainability for multilingual publishing, as well as APIs for with the existing platforms, in our case, OGS, WordPress, and newly the Canadian aggregator, RUD. Let me just point out a few relevant technological de uh, details here um, that you see on the chart as well. So Word Google Docs for copy editing and communicating with the authors, as much as we would have liked to, uh, we knew we could not insist on authors detoxing from Microsoft Word. Copy editors use Word for communicating with authors and are trained in recognizing the worst uh, formatting problems referred to, uh, this is a techno technological term, a word junk, uh, because they are aware of what the files look like in Markdown. Semantic Markdown and uh, metadata, we don't use a database. Uh, the first production stage involves a separation of metadata and article text body. Metadata are entered into OGS and acquired for the typesetting process through the API, which yields JSON files. We opted for JSON as a human readable format over a database. Pandot Lua is used for scripting the conversion from DocX to Markdown. As a sort of X-ray of the text, Markdown is also very well suited for preliminary uh, semantic text and format corrections. So headings, stuff like that. HTML is the basis for design, so the HTML galley is generated from the JSON metadata and the Markdown file by a Pandoc Lewis script. A PDF is generated from the HTML galley, galley without any changes by a Prince XML script, and Prince is the only non-open tool that we use. We had the good fortune that uh, uh, the uh, one of the, well, actually the uh, CIO of 
uh, Prince Hakam William Lee, the older ones of us know him as uh, the original creator of the CSS uh, specification at CERN, took an interest in the journal and uh, actually gave us a license for free and, and also helped out with the design. Um, aggregation in multiple venues, so that's OJS, WordPress, and FFD, that's just through the API calls. Uh, and uh, all this is accomplished by a sort of minimal uh, user interface uh, in Flask and uh, assist maintainability of the code through GitLab. So what is what looks here like a complicated workflow is actually quite easy. Uh, what you see here uh, is the Flask input form for the OGS backend, uh, the metadata in uh, JSON. Uh, they, so there, there is this parallelism of metadata and the text uh, that a simple script uh, then combines uh, document conversion utilities uh, and a, uh, let me just go back to the first one, uh, a way of pushing all this through this Flask interface to the, back to the API uh, that connects with uh, OJS and uh, WordPress. So these two prong uh, possibilities. And the PDF that is generated then can also produce print output uh, if uh, we have the funding for a print issue, which we had once. Um, so um, I would like to conclude here, or maybe I can actually, yeah, I can show, very quickly show you two examples. Um, this is an example of a, a trilingual uh, article uh, in Spanish and uh, English with CACGL uh, terminology interspersed. And what we uh, discovered here, apart from the fact that it could also be multimodal and the telling of a story of a performance group, uh, which was very important for uh, this article, is that the side-by-side -side publishing of English and Spanish is actually much easier in HTML than in InDesign by using Flexbox, right? Spanish is... Uh, the English is shorter uh, in, in typesetting uh, than Spanish, but Flexbox, of course, handles this uh, beautifully. Uh, and uh, here is another example where we, uh, we, co we cooperate with the authors as much as possible, uh, also in the design. Uh, so it's, uh, it, um, these are, in HTML, we can do this kind of co-design uh, that uh, is very difficult otherwise. In this case, uh, the designer author actually uh, had an InDesign uh, galley that we reproduced here uh, in HTML uh, also uh, for the PDF. Uh, it's the most complex part of the design, uh, but it's actually not that complex uh, to achieve all that in the open uh, HTML uh, format. All right, so uh, my conclusions. Uh, I would like to conclude on a bit of a utopian note here uh, with a few questions about academic publishing prompted by daily practice and work with authors and editors that might make us rethink the goals and assessment parameters uh, that uh, I hopefully uh, formulate here as a provocation. Uh, what if we reimagined academic knowledge as something that should not strive to reach a global audience all the time, but rather be curated, communicated, and cared for in the context of specific communities, languages, academic traditions, and so on. What if a plurality of formats traditional and emerging could coexist and its value were not conceived as a scale of prestige of privileged ranked journals? In Megan Morris's words, these largely unread repositories of sometimes British, usually American, blind reviews. And we all know how, you know, ableist this, this phrase in itself is. Uh, but rather as intellectual instruments of care, solidarity, and social justice. What if academic publishing were not conceptualized as an endless game of competition and capitalist production with its connotations of a self-regulating market of ideas but reimagined as a collective effort in the stewardship of a multiplicity of knowledges in diverse plural languages for the benefit of specific, possibly rather small communities and neighbors, driven by principles of the pleasure of friendliness, conviviality, and companionable connection. 
And last, what if decolonized knowledge and the commitment to social justice were to imply a divorce from the underlying mechanisms of teleological progress and the rationality that has posited the market as the ultimate arbiter of common sense and knowledge production. Thank you. <laughs>